and um, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, represent the Islamic Studies Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs for this lecture and book launch uh, by Professor James Robinson of Harvard University, uh, and also to have this distinguished panel, as well as with which my colleague Sami Atallah, who's the executive director of the Middle East Center for Policy Studies will introduce in more detail. <coughs> this is a, a joint lecture between uh, the Islam Fadis Institute and the Middle East Center for Policy Studies. Um, the book has this book, which is going to be launched, which is also the, the title of the, uh, of the lecture, Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty, uh, has already, in, in the short period, it's been out, become seminal. Uh, it, it's caused much discussion and debate. Um, in both scholarly and policy worlds and, and circles. And unlike most academic or books written by academics, it is actually legible and, and readable and recommended even to, for, for general audiences. Um, it's, it's going to be a, a book and a discussion which will be around us for, for many, uh, many years and, and beyond that. Um, and I'm very pleased that uh, Professor Robertson has come to AUB to, to share his views and for the, for the rest of the panel as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to have some introduce the panelists. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Karim, for having us here, and thanks IFI for hosting this book tour with LCPS and the ERF. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes um, to tell you why we're here, uh, beyond what um, Karim has just said. Uh, so one day I get a phone call from <coughs> my dear friend Ahmad Yalab, who's sitting right next to me, and he said to me, Sami, would you be willing to host um, James Robinson uh, for a book tour in Beirut? I was like, wow, that's uh, not a bad idea at all. Uh, I have known Jim's work since I was a graduate student uh, in quantitative methods and political science, and his papers and academic papers were very popular among the students. So it was really a pleasure to actually have him here. Um, so why did I accept um, to actually, uh, in addition to liking his academic papers, is I think um, the argument of the book, and which is based on 15 years of research on the seminal role of political institutions in affecting economic growth. Um, and what I really love about the book is that the fact that Marshall's evidence, um, historical evidence, and takes the reader to on a journey, a journey from um, uh, Korea in 1945 to the Roman Empire, to the Soviet Union, and back to why Arizona is performing better, some parts of Arizona is performing better than another, to Africa, even to the Ottoman Empire. So it's sort of a really nice book to look at and to read because it really takes you on a really journey to make the point that institutions really, really matter and have. Um, and I think this is very important for us as both academics and policy makers, or people who are actually working on policy, simply because the role of institutions and how to reform institutions and how to think of institutions and which institutions matter is really, really important. We take them for granted, uh, but we're going to hear from Jim if, we, if they really can be changed and how can they be changed and how can they actually affect the economic growth in the, in the long run? Um, since we just over lunch, we decided to shift things around and have asked Ahmed um, to actually say a few words. Uh, Ahmed um, is going to give us the pleasure uh, to answer three whys, I believe. Uh, why Jim, why now, and why ERF? So I'm going to give Ahmed uh, the floor uh, just to give us answers to these three whys and <coughs> move to um, Jim's talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sami. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ahmed Yalal and I'm the Managing Director of the Economic Research Forum. If you haven't heard about ERF, it's uh, a regional uh, network of economists. Uh, that covers the Arab countries, Iran, and Turkey. We do research, we do dissemination, we do capacity building. That's pretty much the story. Uh, in terms of, uh, well, your real speaker is really sitting next to me. It's not me, nor Sami, nor Karim, for that matter. They're all great guys, but the real uh, guest of honor tonight is 
uh, Jim Robinson. So I'm not going to stand between you and him for too long. Just bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, why Jim? Why now? Why ERF? Uh, they are very uh, relevant questions, I guess, to sit it up, sort of. Why Jim? Uh, he's a great guy to begin with. He's a good friend of ERF and of the region. And uh, he is someone in my book who has the courage to ask the right questions. I have a, had a professor of mine in the 70s who had something that I quite value. It's better to ask the right question or to answer the right question imperfectly than to answer the wrong question perfectly. This is actually something that not many people take to heart. And I think Jim is one of those people who ask the right question. Why do nations fail? Well, that, of course, uh, the other side of the story, the other side of the coin is why do countries succeed and countries don't? I think that is a big question. So even if Jim's answer is not the perfect answer, it's better to be close to being right, in the right direction, rather than being uh, asking the wrong question and coming up with irrelevant answers. Uh, and I do believe that what's being advanced here today and in the book and a cumulative uh, body of work on political economy of uh, economic development or prosperity, if you like, is really the question of all questions in a way. So I'm uh, pleased to uh, be in the business of inviting Jem to come to the region because I think he has a lot to offer to all of us. Why uh, now? Well, we all know that this region has had one season and the colors of the leaves don't change. Then suddenly something has happened. They call it Arab Spring, now it's autumn, perhaps it's something else, but the good news is we have change of colors. We just lived with one color for too long. And I think this is the time when you have political change taking place. This is the time when you want to have insights. What's happening? Does it make sense? How does it... Uh, compare with other parts of the world? Can we benefit from somebody else's blunder so that we don't blunder too much for too long? I think that is the right time to invite someone like Jim to talk to us about. Why ERF? As I said earlier, uh, when I read uh, the book, uh, I mean, I, I'm familiar with Jim's work also for quite some time, but when I read the book, I thought this is a kind of book that you actually want to disseminate. So I thought I'd invite him to talk both to, in three places, in Lebanon, Cairo, and Tunisia. And I thought that would be a good representation. I hope next time I'll be able to invite him to Saudi Arabia. He's going to go by himself. <laughs> but, but, uh, but hopefully, uh, we'll have spring everywhere. I'm going to stop here and uh, looking forward to hearing from him, from you, the Q&A. I think we are going to have a good discussion this evening. Thank you. Uh Okay, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, I'd like to, I'm very grateful to the ERF for Ahmed uh, persuading me to come uh, to the region and, and talk about the book. That's sort of very exciting for me. Um, it's not uh, part of the world that, uh, that I've ever done sort of serious research on. So anything I say about the... I'm gonna, well, I won't be able to resist the temptation to talk a little bit about the Middle East and the comparative economic development and the economic history of the Middle East and how that fits into the framework in the book. But needless to say, that's not the kind of main focus of the book. Most of my research and my research with Daron, I should say, this is all research with uh, Daron Ashmolu, of course, who is from the region, but he's a somewhat conflicted Armenian stroke Turk. So, you know, so he's never involved himself too much in the sort of research on the region per se. Most of our much more detailed research has been about Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa and Western Europe. And I think that's the trying to understand the politics and the economic history of those parts of the world has sort of inspired our way of thinking about comparative economic development. Of course, the book is, try, the book is trying to develop a simple framework <laughs> for thinking about patterns, what drives patterns of comparative economic and political development. And of course, you'd like a framework to apply everywhere, even those parts of the world which don't have, in which you don't have the same uh, knowledge as in other parts of the world. So I'll have a go at talking about East Asia a little bit and maybe the Middle East, and we could discuss how that fits in. So uh, I'm also very grateful to the uh, Lebanese Center for Policy Studies for bringing me here and facilitating this trip, and the American University for inviting me to come here today. It's a real privilege for me. And uh, 
I'm very happy to be here. Okay, so uh, what's the book about? So why nations fail? Well, it's really about comparative economic development. So fail, state failure, you know, we could discuss when people talk about state failure, they mean a sort of complete collapse of the state and, you know, and maybe that's, that's part of the story, but that's not really the big part. part the real part, uh, the real, what the book is really about is trying to prevent, pre present a simple way of thinking about comparative economic development. So, uh, so I'd like to start with this slide. It's a bit, it's a bit distorted for some reason. Uh, but this slide is just to sort of illustrate, let me, I could just start talking about this slide and then you'll get an idea about what the book is about. What is this slide? I'm embarrassed to say this doesn't have the Middle East on, on it. But this is just historical estimates of income per capita. So average income per person in different parts of the world over the last thousand years. So I don't want you to take any specific numbers very seriously. You know, we could argue for months about what, which number was right or how we would calculate this. I just want to say, what is the book about? Well, the book is about several things. The book is trying to develop a way of thinking about differences in prosperity today. So why is it that, you know, Sweden or the United States has higher levels of uh, income per capita than Colombia or Lebanon or India or Nepal? And so sort of looking across the world today, but i show you this picture to emphasize the kind of dynamics of that process. So the world wasn't always so unequal as it is today. In fact, if you went back in history three or four hundred years, differences in living standards of prosperity between different parts of the world uh, were not very large at all. And in some cases, you know, they're even reversed relative to what they are today, as I'll talk about in more detail. So I want to emphasize this historical picture because the book is both about trying to explain why the world looks like it does today, but it's also about trying to explain how the world got like that. Okay? And that's useful, thinking historically is useful for lots of reasons. We've always found that in our research we found that very useful as a way of trying to distinguish between different types of hypotheses about what drives prosperity. So thinking about history gives you a lot more kind of gives you a much larger sample in some sense of you know, what went on in the world and it eliminates various types of hypotheses and I'll try to give you a flavor of that in a second when I start motivating the whole thing by talking about the economic and political history of the Americas. But I also think it shows you that it's a very dynamic picture. You know, that the, the world wasn't always like it was today. It used to be historically that some parts of the world that are very economically successful and rich like England for example, were poor and dysfunctional. And they changed and became very different. Okay? So I think if you look at the world today in sort of cross-section, it's easy to get very pessimistic about, oh, poor countries are poor and they're stuck you know, with whatever they're stuck. And, you know, but actually, if you think about it historically, there's a lot of dynamism and the world changes and societies do better and you know, they get onto different development paths. And I'm not saying that's easy, and I'll talk much more precisely about how we think that happens or doesn't happen. But I do think that's kind of important to keep in mind that part regions, different parts of the world, you know, uh, change their development path over time. That in 1500, it would have been very, very difficult to predict, or 1600, or even 1700, it would have been very difficult to predict that the United States was much more economically successful than other parts of the America. And certainly at the start of the early modern period, you'd never been able to predict that England would become the most economically successful part of the world. You'd never been able to predict that based on what that was like. But England changed, changed its politics and its economics in ways I'll try to talk about. And it became very successful economically. So, so the dynamics of the picture is also uh, important. Okay, so uh, as, as Sammy was saying, you know, this book is an attempt to put together in a simple way a lot of the things that Daron and I think we've learned from our research in the last 15 years. And before I start talking about what this theory is and what the building blocks are and some of the terminology, I want to motivate it by just giving a story. So the book is full of sort of stories and historical stories. And part of the reason, you know, we use that a lot for motivating the ideas and the concepts. And part of the reason the book's written the way it is, is that, you know, the research that Daron and I have done together, we've always been very inspired by reading history or anthropology or sociology or whatever it is. We're very sort of eclectic in what we're interested in. 
And we've always been inspired by historical examples or different cases or, you know, sort of concepts coming out of different areas of social sciences and even humanities. I don't know historians differ about what history is, but anyway. So, uh, of course, a lot of history is not social science in some instance. Anyway, and so, but of course, the type of academic <coughs> journals that we publish in are not interested in things like that. So year after year, we've had this experience of sending articles to journals, and they come back with kind of lines through all the bits that we found interesting. And in the end, all the all the the stuff, a lot of the stuff that inspires our research, it gets disappeared, and the only thing that's left are the mathematics and the statistics. So we we wanted to find a vehicle. You know, then we decided, yeah, well. If we found these things so inspiring, you know, this very, you know, we've always tried to take a very interdisciplinary, I mean, I've seen my experience as an academic, I've always found it very bewildering that, you know, I used to teach in an economics department, and now I teach in a political science department, but at some point I realized that there's people in history, in sociology, in anthropology, in political science, and economics, and they're all interested in exactly the same thing that I'm interested in, and they all come at it from different ways, which is incredibly interesting because it's so easy to get stuck in one way of thinking in academia, I always found it incredibly fun when someone is interested in the same thing, but they come with a completely different set of concepts and ideas and historical examples and methods. And so, so the book is to sort of say, well, you know, if we found this stuff inspiring, maybe somebody else will too. So let's try to put it together to, you know, to like that. Okay. So enough of the discussion. Okay. So, so. What is this explanation? So let me motivate this by talking about the. Uh, Economic history of the Americas. Okay. Why start with the Americas? Okay. Well, we'll see. Go back 500 years. Okay, to the time of the colonization of the Americas by the Europeans. Okay. Uh, America, the Americas was not a sort of tabula rasa. There were very advanced civilizations in the Central Valley of Mexico, in Andean South America, and different parts of the continent. Uh, but what's interesting about the Americas and trying to think about the economic and political history of the Americas and why it's so powerful is that I think if you think about the differences in the Americas historically, these were at the time of European colonization, these were quite small. Today they're very large. We know that North America, the United States, Canada has income, levels of income per capita which are much larger than any, anywhere in South America. And indeed, if you think of the whole span of levels of development in the Americas, that covers basically the whole world. You know, it goes all the way down to Haiti, uh, which has an income per capita as low as any country on the planet. Okay? So you have the entire sort of spectrum of riches and poverty within the Americas. And somehow this emerged over the past 300 or 400 years. Okay? Now, why did that emerge? Was that something that kind of persisted from, you know, kind of larger in scale, but qualitatively you know, similar to what you saw at the time of the conquest? Quite the opposite, actually. At the time of the conquest of the Americas, the poorest parts were North America and the southern cone of Latin America, which are now the richest parts. The parts which are more advanced technologically, politically, were Mexico, Central America, Andean, and South America. They had roads, they had infrastructure, they had famine relief. You know, the Inca Empire built 25,000 miles of roads. They had an enormous organization. They had tax system. They moved goods and people about. You know, the same with the Mexicas people in Mexico. So actually, if you thought about it historically, you thought about it today, the pattern of relative prosperity you see in the Americas is something which is completely reversed relative to the position you saw at the time of the, at the, time of the conquest. So why is that significant? I think that's significant because the only really plausible explanation for why the Americas now look so different than it did historically is the impact of European colonialism and the very different types of societies that European colonialism created in different parts of the Americas. So this is not a book about colonialism per se. Colonialism is, you know, one, European colonialism is one big <coughs> source of variation in economic development in the world today. There's lots of other sources of variation today. I start with this example just because I think if we think about the Americas historically, it's sort of much cleaner to kind of see what went on relative to other parts of the world, maybe like the Middle East or South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, where the story is much more complicated and there's European colonialism, but there's other stuff going on. And okay, so, 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 so with that idea in mind that 
what this enormous divergence you see in the Americas today and the fact that this, the pattern of relative prosperity in the Americas is very different to what it was historically. Let me think about how that could be somehow related to European colonialism. Okay? And I guess you could think that's related to European colonialism in lots of different ways. You could be sitting there thinking, well, that's, you know, we know the Spanish went to, went to South America and the English went to North America. We know the English people were different. You know, they had the common law and they had, you know, they had civilized institutions or something, or they had cricket or, you know, irony or, you know, there was something, the Spanish had the Inquisition. And so there was something, you know, Protestants, Catholics, common law. So, you know, there was all, you know, you could think, so you have, might have some story in mind about these, this is what generates the difference. So I'll try and persuade you that that's not true at all. And let me start by telling you about what I think is really significant about different differential, differential patterns of colonization in North and South America and what drove these different types of societies that emerged. Okay. So I usually, I'd like to start, let me start with Latin America very briefly, and then I'll talk about North America. So here's the, the story about Latin America, the emergence of colonial society in Latin America that I like very much, is the foundation of Buenos Aires. So I don't know if anyone here has been to Buenos Aires in the capital of Argentina. Now, you know, Buenos Aires in some sense is the most grand, elegant city in uh, uh, Latin America. In fact, many Argentines get very insulted. If you know, I was once at a conference where I made a comparison between Bolivia and Argentina, and an Argentine gentleman in the audience got very upset with me. He said, "He said, you, you, what? English guy? Are you? Huh? Uh, England? You compare England and Albania? They're both in Europe. Do you compare England to Albania?" So you know, he was upset. You know, the idea that he was, we were comparing Argentina to Bolivia. But if you go back and think about the history of Buenos Aires, it's very interesting. When the Spanish first came, they thought there was silver. They called it the Rio de la Plata. But it turned out there wasn't silver. There was some silver around, but it had come all the way from the Andes far to the west in the Inca Empire. It had got traded all the way there. So there wasn't silver deposits. The local indigenous people there were Stone Age hunter-gatherers, very few on the ground. Uh, they ran around. The Spanish tried to capture them. Very difficult. Uh, they were not happy. They sent out expeditions. They couldn't find any silver. Up the Paraná River in what's now Paraguay, they discovered the Guarani. The Guarani were sedentary agricultural society with hierarchy and taxes. The Spanish abandoned Buenos Aires en masse, moved up the river, and took over the Guarani. Okay? So in everywhere you look during the Spanish colonial period, the Spanish came and they took over to control indigenous societies. So if you look at the economy, how did the economy function? How was the economy structured? And this is kind of at the heart of the book. It's, it was based on the exploitation of indigenous people. So labor market institutions, access to land, ownership rights, were structured by the desire to control <laughs> and extract rents from indigenous people. So right the way early on, you get the emergence of this very hierarchical society based on creation of monopolies, distortions, barriers to entry, extraction of rents, coerced labor in colonial Latin America. If you want to know why you know, Latin America is the most unequal part of the world today, that's why. Okay? So you might say, OK, but that's 500 years ago. How could that possibly be relevant to today? Well, I'm coming to that. Okay. So, so this is what happens in Latin America. What happens in North America? Okay. While well, you're thinking, well, you know, it's the British, isn't it? The British, it was the Spanish that did that sort of thing. The British didn't do that sort of thing. They didn't go around coercing labor and, well, hold on a second. You might have heard of South Africa or Zimbabwe. That was created by the British. South Africa and Zimbabwe look an awful lot like Latin American countries. They were based on labor coercion, monopolies, extraction of rents from indigenous people. It's not a coincidence that South Africa has a level of inequality which is very similar to a Latin American country. And they were created by English people, not by Spaniards or Portuguese. Okay? So let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about the origins of North America. Okay? 1607, the Jamestown colony. Okay? So this is the traditional start of the British colonization of the United States. What did the British do when they came in 1607? Well, they had a model. Okay? And their model was explicitly based on the Spanish colonization of the Americas. So the English expanded late. In the early modern period, England was this pathetic kind of also-ran 
country, unimportant. Spain and France, Portugal, that's where the action was. So the British were very late in getting their act together in starting to build up colonies. 1607, they came to Jamestown. What did they do? They had a model. What was their model? Their model was, how do you colonize the Americas? First thing you do is you capture the local Indian chief. That's what the Spanish did. They captured Montezuma. They ca Pizarro, uh, Cortes captured Montezuma. Pizarro captured Atahualpa. Uh, Jimenez de Quesada captured King Bacata in what's now Colombia. Uh, that was the model. You capture the local Indian chief. Once you capture the local Indian chief, you get this immense leverage over indigenous society. And then the indigenous people work. You kind of set yourself up as this aristocracy and beautiful. Okay. So that was their model. So they got to Jamestown and they started trying to figure out who the local Indian chief was. And that was a gentleman called Wahan Sunakok. Okay. But this was a very different society than Central Valley of Mexico or Andean South America or even in modern Colombia. This was much more like the Pampa. This was much more like Argentina but with no Guarani up the river. The local people were very thin on the ground. They weren't organized into hierarchical polities. King Wahan Sunakot was a very suspicious guy. You know, if you read about the history of the colonization in the Americas, you realize that these big people like At Atahualpa, who was the, the Inca, he thought he was the most powerful guy in the world. You know, Wahan Sunakot was suspicious. He was nervous of these people. So he, they said, come, come to Jamestown. You know, they had this plan to capture him. Come to Jamestown. You know, and he was like, no, 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 I'm not coming there. You can come to me, but I'm not coming there. So the first year and a half, they sort of played this game of trying to capture the local Indian, of Wahan Sunakot. And the second winter, two-thirds of them starved to death. They starved to death because they didn't bother planting any crops. That's not how you colonize the Americas. You didn't work colonizing the Americas. You s enslaved the indigenous people, and they did the work. Okay? So they came with exactly the same model. This was not some British transplantation of different institutions or something. This was same model, same idea. But the thing is, that model didn't work in Virginia. It didn't work in colonial United States. So after the first couple of years, the Virginia company was getting really upset. They were, try they were in it for the money, the Virginia company. They were, it was a profit-making enterprise. So then they were like, okay, fine, so this doesn't work. We can't exploit the indigenous people. Let's try plan B. Plan B is let's exploit the English people. And they sent a new governor and they passed some laws. So here's some of the laws. And the first law is interesting. It says, no man or woman shall run away from the colony to the Indians upon pain of death. English people, as you'll know, are notoriously work shy and difficult to exploit. And uh, their reaction to the attempt to exploit them was to run off and live with the Indians. So they abandoned Jamestown and ran off to live with the Indians. Okay? There were other problems with this model, but, but, but there was a 10-year attempt to exploit the English people. Because one of the problems was that if you realize that the only way to have a viable colony is to get English people to come, it was difficult to get more English people to come if you were exploiting the ones that were there. So in 1618, they did something radical. They decided, OK, we can't, and you know, something radical, which is why the United States ended up like it is. And what they did, which was radical, was they decided, OK, we can't exploit the indigenous people. That's not viable. We can't exploit the English people. We'd like to, but it just won't wash. We could try something else. We could try giving them incentives. So they gave up on, they abolished all the labor contracts. So they, a lot of these people there in Virginia were what's called indentured laborers. So they had these indentured contracts. So they gave up on, they, they freed them from their labor contracts. They gave everyone 50 acres of land. So up until that point, the Virginia company kind of maintained this fiction that they owned all the land. They gave up on that and they started giving people land. And they said, you get more people to come, we give all of them 50 acres too. And they did something even more dramatic, which is they introduced in 1619 an assembly which basically made all of this credible. So you could say, the Virginia company could say, well, you know, you can, we'll free you from this labor contract, we'll give you this land. But if they maintained all the power, how was any of that going to stick? So they decided the only way to make this credible was to give the, allow the colonists to basically decide on the institutions by giving them political rights. Okay? 1619, adult males, adult males had the right to decide on their institutions. This is not the transplantation of English institutions. Adult males didn't have the vote in England until 300 years later. Okay? So this is the emergence of a particular set of 
economic and political institutions. What do I mean by institutions? I just mean rules, you know, the rules that structure incentives and constraints in society. Those rules can be formal, they can be written down, they can be like the Constitution of Virginia, or they can be much more informal. But what emerges in the early struggle over the nature of society in Virginia is a very, very different type of society than you see emerging in Latin America. A society where there's much more economic opportunity, access to land, access to op you know, op economic opportunities, not characterized by massive distortions or coercion in the labor market, you're going you're, you're gonna to be thinking, hold on a second, didn't they have slavery in the United States? Absolutely. But what these institutions that form in the early colonial United States form before the development of the slave economy in the US South. Okay? I'm going to, in a second, I'm going to abstract from these histories of Latin America and North America and sort of say, I'm going to call these things two things. I'm going to call this certain type of economic institutions, this certain type of economic institutions. And I'm going to, there's this dichotomy. The dichotomy is very simple, okay? So there's, it's just to develop the argument. There's lots of shades of gray in reality, and I'm happy to talk about shades of gray. And I think that US, the slavery in the US was certainly a shade of gray. You know, if you look at the US South, the slave South, it was much poorer than the North. It had far less manufacturing industry, less urbanization, less infrastructure. It was poor backward. If the US South had won the Civil War in the 1860s, the US would be a backward, poor place today. You know, that's contingency in history, and I can talk about contingency uh, as well. Uh, uh, that's, you know, there's no deterministic kind of account of world history. And the South was very close to winning the Civil War. In the first six months, they almost captured uh, Washington, D.C. So it was a close-run thing. So, so, so OK, so a uh, very different type of society emerges. The type of battle that I described, the type of conflict that I described going on in Virginia went on elsewhere, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, the Carolinas. But these two types of societies that emerge, you know, this is the crucial thing for understanding the differences between the United States and Latin America. Now you're going to say, as I said earlier, oh come on, give me a break. This is history. You know, it's fun, but it's not relevant for understanding what, went, what goes on today. Well, let me try to give you some examples of how it is relevant for understanding what went on today. The idea in the book is that in the Americas, fundamentally, this early colonial period and the societies that developed set Latin America and North America off in these very different development paths. And once society gets organized politically and economically in a particular way, there's enormous forces that tend to reproduce that, uh, that organization. And so let me give you one very nice example that I did a lot of research on with a former student of mine, Camilo Garcia, from the 19th century. Okay? So, Fast forward to the 19th century. In the first chapter of the book, we kind of tell this history. You have lots of different examples. But let me just talk about the 19th century. 19th century, the world, second half of the 19th century, the world economy expands, transportation costs fall. Suddenly, all this land that's been sitting there in the Americas becomes valuable. Often, it has indigenous people uh, on it. Indigenous people you know, get devastated and lose out you know, wherever it is, North America, South America, the key difference is that you couldn't build a society in North America based on the exploitation of indigenous people. Not that the indigenous people did badly also, you know, and this is not a statement about human welfare. This is just a positive theory about develop, different development paths. Okay? So I'm not saying there's anything good about this from a normative point of view. I'm just trying to explain why North America is today relative to South America. So, so 19th century, suddenly all this land is valuable, okay? Uh, what happens to this land? Well, in North America, in the United States, starting in the 18th century, but consolidated in 1862 in what's called the Homestead Act, this land is basically expropriated by the state and opened up to, for homesteading, meaning any person can go carve out a farm, put a fence around it, file for title, okay? So how come you got this very egalitarian distribution of frontier land in 19th century North America, in 19th century North America? Canada is similar. Because the political system was very open. By 1860, women couldn't vote again. Black people couldn't vote. Uh, black men uh, got to vote after 1865. 
But white, adult white men got to vote. And this was a very broad distribution of political rights by mid -19th century, for the mid-19th century world. That, made, that forced the political system to create this egalitarian system of access to the frontier. What's happened in Latin America? Well, in Latin America, with the exception of Costa Rica, so Costa Rica, there's two exceptions. One is Costa Rica, the other is Colombia. Costa Rica is more interesting. The Colombians passed similar laws to the Homestead Act, but Colombia being Colombia, they never enforced the laws, so it's set in pockets. Costa Rica is more interesting, but in most Latin American countries, what happened when all of this frontier land became valuable? What you got is incredibly oligarchic frontier expansion. So in Chile, for example, in Chile there was a frontier expansion in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, the frontier land was, was expropriated by the government. It was divided into huge lots and auctioned off to politically connected people. Okay? Completely different oligarchic expansion of the frontier. Why did they have that outcome in Chile rather than the US outcome? That's because in Chile in the 19th century, political rights were very narrowly concentrated. So politically powerful elites organized the allocation of frontier in their interest to stop their labor force running away and to you know, access the resources themselves. So think about it. What you have in the US is you have this much broader distribution of political power. That creates a broad distribution of, much broader distribution of assets that helps to reinforce the initial distribution of political power in society. In Latin America, you have this very narrow, narrow kind of oligarchized distribution of political power. That generates a very oligarchized distribution of assets, which similarly tends to reinforce the initial distribution of political rights. So there's a lot of feedback loops in between the economics and the politics, such that once society gets organized in a political way, there's this sort of inertia. Okay. Of course, there's also transitions, but as I said to start with, but there's also inertia. So, 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 so you know, that's why transition is, is hard, as people know in the Middle East. So, so, so let me, you know, in the first chapter, we kind of tell this story, and we try to tell this story of this path-dependent development over time in the Americas, and we come right the way up to today to the two richest men in the world, which is Bill Gates and Carlos Slim. Okay? Now, what's significant about Bill Gates and Carlos Slim, other than they're very rich and that Carlos Slim, I guess, is Lebanese originally? Uh, well, uh, it's the way they made their money. How did they make their money? Bill Gates, uh, fundamentally, you can all start complaining about windows and stuff, but at the end of the day, Bill Gates made his money through innovation. Okay? Of course, he wanted to be a monopolist. Everyone wants to be a monopolist. You know, read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith says, you get a few businessmen in a room, they come up with some scheme to defraud the public. Okay? Everyone wants to be a monopolist. You know? Even we'd like to be intellectual monopolists. You know? so, 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 but the point is that Gates couldn't get away with that. He was dragged in front of the US Antitrust Commission and slapped down. How did Carlos Slim made his money? Carlos Slim is a great businessman, but he's a brilliant entrepreneur. Carlos Slim made his money by inside, you know, using political connections, creating monopolies, uh, etc. Okay, that's how you make your money in Latin America. You get monopolies. Okay, it's nothing to do with Carlos Slim. If he'd been in the U.S., he'd have been like Bill Gates, or you know, if he'd been in, if Bill Gates had been in Mexico, he'd have been putting his energy into constructing monopolies and making contacts with the politicians to protect them. Mexico, they have an antitrust uh, commission. Colombia, uh, they have a wonderful set of antitrust laws. They paid consultants lots of money to write them in the 1980s. Not one company has ever been prosecuted under them. So, 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 you know, so just thinking about how Gates and Slim made their money is very indicative of the different ways in which these societies work, which has a huge impact on how talented people allocate their energies and efforts and Okay, so let me take this story and try to sort of abstract some concepts out of this. So, so there's two layers here that are kind of really important. And the first layer, I think, is just totally uncontroversial. And it's the economics, okay? And we want to say there's the way these econo economies are organized, the economic institutions that influence opportunities and incentives in North America and Latin America, let me give those names. Let me call these institutions in North America inclusive economic institutions. 
And let me call the institutions in Latin America extractive economic institutions. So where does this word inclusive come from? And let me give you another historical example that I like very much, uh, which comes from the uh, research by uh, the late Ken Sokolov, who was a, a great economic historian. So what Ken did was he studied patenting uh, data for the United States. So in the 19th century, the US becomes, becomes the most economically uh, dynamic country in the world. And how is that based? It's based on innovation. Okay, so economists, we've known since the work of Robert Solo in the 1950s that what drives long-run economic growth is innovation. It's new ideas, new techniques, things that raise productivity. Go back to the English Industrial Revolution, the thing that started that picture off. What's the, in, what's the Industrial Revolution about? It's all about innovation. It's about, the manufa it's about, man it's about mechanization of production. Okay, Kay's flying shuttle and Arkwright's mule. It's about the factory system, organization. It's about inanimate power, the steam engine, new methods of transportation. It's about innovation, raising productivity. Same in the 19th century. But what Sokolov shows is really interesting is that if you look at all these innovators, people who took out patents to protect their intellectual property rights, okay? So there's an interesting example of an inclusive economic institution. You come up with an innovation, you come up with an idea, you can go and you can take out a patent to protect your intellectual property rights. And anyone can go. You don't need to have connections to some politicians or be an insider or anything like that. You can just go, you can get access to this and you can protect your intellectual property rights. But what Sokolov showed is that if you look at the social background of these people, they come from everywhere. They come from all over the spectrum. Elites, non-elites, farmers, artisans, poor people, rich people. So, so Solo's insight about innovation, productivity, where are these ideas? Where are these skills, talents, energies? They're very broadly distributed in society. And you need an economy which can access those things, which can incentivize people, give people opportunities. If you have an economy like in Latin America, kind of where there's endemic labor coercion, where people are blocked from opportunities, where there's monopolies, whatever, you, you're just throwing away your talent. You're just taking away the main asset in society and not allowing it to work. So, so that's where this word inclusive comes from. And it's inclusive in a very important sense, I think. So I think the Sokolov example kind of illustrates that. So, 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 so inclusive and extractive institutions. I think this is, you know, this is just straightforward economics as far as I'm, I'm concerned. You know, the fact that you know, in the economy in Egypt you had all of this crony capitalism where people got monopolies <coughs> because they were connected to the regime, which meant that other people couldn't have economic opportunities or couldn't take up different particular occupations or get into particular industries because there was some monopoly. That's, you know, that's, we understand as economists that's a very inefficient allocation of resources and that's, that's what we're talking about. But of course, think about that history I told you. It's not a coincidence that, you know, you know, how is it that the United States ended up with these economic institutions and Colombia didn't? Is that because some clever economist at Harvard or something came along and said, you know, you should really do it like this, okay? It has nothing whatsoever to do with it. It's the outcome of a long run sort of political process. And in the book, we really emphasize that the politics that lies behind these institutions is absolutely critical, okay? What keeps particular structures of economic institutions in place is particular political structures and political institutions. So let me give you my favorite example of a kind of extractive society, which illustrates very well, in some sense, the politics that lies behind extractive economic institutions, and maybe also some of the dynamics, okay? So, so the bottom line here about you know, differences in development, differences in prosperity, is that North America managed to uh, develop these inclusive economic institutions and Latin America didn't. Okay, and my favorite example, which I've got to like even more uh, recently, is apartheid South Africa. So, so, so I, guess, I guess I could talk about Egypt, but you know, let me talk about apartheid South Africa. I like this example because I had to give a talk in October at the United Nations in New York, and I realized that anything you say can be can, be, can really upset somebody in the room. And I think in academia, that's sort of fine. We're used to upsetting people and arguing. And, you know, but it, with this is all, these are all politicians. And so I was in this room with about 1,000 people and delegation from every single country. And I had my stock of examples, and I thought, oh, my, I'm gonna, this is, I can't use that example. I can't use that example. If I use that example, some, you know, so what, what example can I use? And then I thought, apartheid South Africa. 
I'll criticize apartheid South Africa. Nobody can say anything good about it. I defy anyone in this room to say something good about apartheid South Africa. Okay, what was apartheid South Africa? Apartheid South Africa was just this kind of normal European colonial society. There was a bunch of white settlers, about 20% of the population, and then there were the indigenous people, the Africans. How, what were economic institutions like in apartheid South Africa? Well, in 1913, uh, the whites decided, let's define the bit of the country that's ours and the bit of the country that's for the Africans. So we'll take 93% and we'll give 7% to the Africans that make up 80% of the population. 93%, that was the so-called the white economy. In the white economy, black people couldn't own land and they couldn't start a business. They couldn't undertake any skilled occupation or professional occupation. In fact, there was a huge list of professions which black people couldn't undertake. Black people couldn't be brick makers, they couldn't be boiler makers, they couldn't be coopers, they couldn't be teachers, they couldn't be lawyers, they couldn't be doctors. This is like a classic example of an extractive economic institution. I mean, you're just taking away people's opportunities and incentives. You're throwing away all the talent and potential in society. Why would you do that? What could black people do? Well, they could work as unskilled workers in the mines or factories. What a crazy system. Well, it was very good for the whites who owned the land and the mines. They got lots of labor at very low wages. So you know, this is sort of what happened in colonial Latin America. The details were different, but the system is the same. 1994, what happens? How was that system underpinned politically? Black people, came, some economists came along and said to black people, you know, this is really the way to go. Forget these professions and human capital and business. You know, This was about politics. The whites had the guns, they had the hegemony and the political dominance, and they created a set of economic institutions that were designed to impoverish black people to their benefit. Of course, it came along with an ideology of separate existence and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, okay, even slavery came along with an ideology. So, uh, what happened in 1994? So, up until 1994, this system was underpinned by a particular type of politics where only white people got to decide on the structure of institutions and black people didn't have any political power. In 1994, the system democratized and suddenly black people got the vote. Black people voted to maintain the color bar? No, black people voted to get rid of all of these institutions. It's just not sustainable when political structures changed. Okay, so, so in some sense, you know, that you could think of, you could say, Hold on a second, that's a very extreme example, isn't it, apartheid South Africa? But you know, that's actually what a lot of the world has looked like you know, over the last 10, you know, thousand years or so. And in fact, if you look at poor countries today, there's a lot of poor countries that look very similar to that, less extreme, different elements. Okay, so, so, so that sort of says, okay, so there's these extractive and inclusive economic institutions. Inclusive econo economic institutions generate prosperity. Extractive economic institutions don't but you can kind of see what the logic behind these things are. And underlying that, there are these political structures. And a lot of the book focuses on that, focuses on the politics of inclusive and extractive institutions and how come you know, different societies end up with these different sorts of politics. So let me try to say a bit more about the politics. We emphasize, sorry, I'm, I, have a, I have a kind of loose relationship to the slides, but it's sort of comforting to have them there. You know. <laughs> Okay, so here, here's, here's extractive, it's a bit of a, it's all a bit of an angle actually, but anyway, here's extractive and ex economic institutions, extractive political institutions. So we kind of say, lying behind these extractive economic and extractive, inclusive economic and extractive economic institutions are extractive, inclusive political institutions, inclusive political institutions underpin inclusive economic institutions and extractive political institutions underpin extractive economic institutions. So what do I mean by inclusive political institutions? Well, we emphasize a couple of things. One thing I alluded to a lot in the US case, which was a broad distribution of political power in society. But the other thing we also emphasize is having a strong kind of what we call this political centralization. So you need to have not just a broad distribution of political power, but you also need to have an effective centralized state. So the answer, you know, we talk about in the, we also, the, the example we use in the book to kind of motivate these concepts is Somalia. So the most famous ethnography of the Somali clans in East Africa by a Welsh social anthropologist called Yon Lewis is called A Pastoral Democracy. And the title's very significant because what Lewis points out, this was a book written in the 1950s, 
What Lewis points out is that if you looked at how the Somali clans made decisions, actually ad decisions were made very democratically by adult men again, only men again, adult men again. And of course, that's actually true in many acephalous societies. You know, if you look at Berber society, how Berbers, I was just reading, I was just in Morocco recently, I was reading an ethnography, a famous ethnography of the Berbers. You know, it's the same thing. Many of these acephalous societies, which did not have a state, actually had quite democratic methods of uh, making decisions. The Berbers even had an interesting system of checks and balances and, you know, rotating powers between different clans. So, but in the case of Somalia, on the one hand, while Lewis points out this is quite a democratic society, most of the book, or half of the book, is taken up with long descriptions of feuds and retaliations and attacks and counter feuds and blood feuds. And so, so the, this, this, this was a society without a state. It was a society where politi centralized political authority never emerged. There were no bureaucrats, there were no police, there were no politicians, there were no judges. So, so this led not to inclusive anything, it just led to kind of continual feuding and anarchy, okay? So, 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 so we want to emphasize these two parts of having inclusive uh, political institutions. And in some sense, the, the theory can be summed up with this diagram. I'm trying to think, when should I shut up? I want to leave time for questions. Can I, can I take like another 10 minutes or something? Okay, right. So think about, we could sum the theory up in some sense with this diagram. I mean, I, you know, there's lots to say, but uh, uh, once I gave a talk at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and it was very poor, it was very poor communication before I got there. So I didn't really know what was going on. When I got in and I asked this Chinese gentleman, I said, I said, how long should I talk for? And he said, not more than four hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so, 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 you know, if I was going to sum the, the talk up in a matrix, I'd say, okay, so what we're kind of emphasizing here is, that this is where you, inclusive economic institutions, inclusive political institutions, inclusive. So this is where, this is the sort of social organization you need to have sustained economic growth, okay? Whereas poor countries in the world are in this cell in the matrix here with extractive institutions and extractive economic institutions underpinned by extractive political institutions. So one of the chapters of the book we called, you know, Why Do Nations Fail to Gay? We kind of look at a whole cross-section of different societies, poor societies in the world today, North Korea, Colombia, Egypt, Uzbekistan, uh, Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, Argentina, you might say, you know, what on earth has Egypt got in common with uh, Uzbekistan or North Korea? Isn't North Korea some ridiculous kind of personalized tin pot communist regime? Sure, but you know, the idea is to say, yes, okay, these countries, their histories differ, the details of their institutions and societies differ, but you can see in all of them, you can see that the poor economic performance through this lens of extractive economic institutions, the details differ a lot, okay? You have mass coerced labor in Uzbekistan. You didn't have mass coerced labor in uh, Egypt. But you had lots of other types of different extractive institutions. What options are available to different political elites depends on history, depends on all sorts of different things, but there's many ways to skin a cat, you know, my mother used to say. So, so you can substitute different instruments for other instruments. And, you know, if something is unavailable, fine, you can use something else. So, so we try to argue all the, ec the economic problems of all these countries can be seen through this lens of extractive economic institutions underpinned by extractive political institutions with various types of pathologies. You know, some of the countries like Uzbekistan or perhaps Egypt during the Mubarak regime, the problem was very narrow distribution of political power in society. Other countries, Colombia, for example, the, there's a broader distribution of political power. There's a more functioning democracy, but the central state is incredibly, the central state is incapable of controlling half of the country, providing order, public goods, or whatever. You know, my, my superficial kind of understanding of the Lebanese case is that, you know, Lebanon is a, is a situation where, again, it's very difficult to construct an effective central state because you, know, because you have many interests in society that don't want to have a central state because they don't trust that the central state can guarantee its interests or act in the collective interest of the society. So this is a, you know, this pro it's in this process of state uh, formation. Okay, so, so, but let me talk a little bit about the dynamics, 
Okay, so I emphasize in the American case this that there are these feedback loops. You know, when I was talking about frontier expansion, the allocation of frontier land, that was supposed to get you thinking that once you're on a particular development path, once society gets organized in a particular way, then there may be a lot of inertia in that. Okay, uh, but the South Africa example also showed that things can change over time. And I emphasize that at the start. And how come things changed in South Africa? You know, was it that the white people in South Africa, I don't know if there's any white South Africans in the audience, but or was it that the white people in South Africa suddenly woke up one day and Jeff Sachs or some economist came and said, you know, this is really not a good idea, you know, exploiting 80% of the people. And the government woke up and said, oh my God, you're right. Well, what have we been doing all these years? You know, it's like the Far Side cartoon. If you know the Far Side, there's a great Far Side cartoon where there are these cows in the field and they're all eating grass, except one of them's looking at, the, looking at you and saying, it's grass. All these years we've been eating grass. <laughs> so, so, no, that's not what happened in South Africa. What happened in South Africa was in, 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 in the 1970s, black people started getting organized. There was the Soweto uprising in 1976. People started mobilizing collectively. They started organizing against the regime they started putting pressure on the regime. Of course, in the South African case, there was also a lot of functional external pressure on the regime. But it was fundamentally, it was fundamentally political pressure, political mobilization by the people who suffered under the extractive institutions in South Africa that forced the regime to change. The regime didn't want to change. It was forced to change. Okay? So you can tell from this description of institutions that I've been giving, or the motivation behind the construction of institutions, or the consequences of different institutional structures, there's going to be a lot of conflict in the organization of society. Okay? So there's conflict over different institutional structures. Okay? Just like there was conflict in the Arab Spring in South Africa, there was conflict historically in Britain. So if you go back to the world which I was describing at the start, where there's very small differences in prosperity between different parts of the world. You could think that all, part, all countries had extractive institutions, more or less, of different degrees. You know, you can track different dynamics historically. You know, Rome rose and fell, or Venice rose and fell, or whatever. But if you think of the start of the early modern period, then what happens is that some countries make a transition to much more inclusive societies. So how did that happen? Well, the British case. That was also about conflict. It was about conflict. The 17th century, England had two civil wars, and both of those civil wars were about how should society be organized? What institutions should govern the society? How should the political system work? Should they have an absolutist system? Should there be a different sort of system? Okay? And after the second revolution, it's called the Glorious Revolution in 1688, a very different type of political society emerged. So in the book, we sort of argue that What's really critical to explaining this enormous kind of fanning out in prosperity that I talked about is how in Britain there's a transition from uh, extractive economic and political institutions to, uh, to uh, much more inclusive political institutions, which then leads to a transition to uh, inclusive economic institutions. Okay? So that pattern takes place in Britain in the 17th and 18th century that triggers all of this economic change. It triggers lots of other institutional dynamics as well that I'm not going to be able to get into. So for one thing, the British go around imposing extractive institutions on large parts of the world, such as India or South Africa or any other place they could get their hands on. That was very common in European colonialism. As I sort of described, that was kind of the plan in North America as well, but the plan went off the rails. It's very similar in Australia. So we talk a little bit, look at the history, early history of Australia. It's something uh, very similar. Uh, so, so Britain made this transition here out of this cell in the matrix uh, into that cell in the matrix. Now, you might ask yourself, if you had been paying kind of careful attention to this diagram, you will have noticed that here, this, this goes clockwise, and here that goes anti-clockwise. And that's of absolutely no significance. <laughs> so that's just to emphasize that the, I don't know how that happened. You know what it's like. So the ghost in the machine. OK, so, so this is a particular path around this matrix. Now, uh, before I start talking about the Ottoman Empire, uh, you know, we sort of, the, the basic kind of theme in the book, trying to explain, you know, I'm trying to give you a sense of 
different, you know, how, how do these different development paths emerge? Well, a, a lot of it stems from the British Industrial Revolution, which stems from this transition in political and then economic institutions. That, you know, that has ramifications uh, throughout Europe. There's different paths to inclusive society. So the US and Australian path is a very different path to an inclusive society. And there's different paths to extractive institutions in the modern world too. One path, as I said, is through European uh, colonialism. Uh, and, you know, but there's other intrinsic paths to extractive institutions. Large parts of the modern world, even before the Europeans colonized them, had pretty extractive institutions. That was true of most parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, even the parts of sub-Saharan Africa which had, oh gosh, what does that say? Restart later, I think, probably best. Uh, uh, even those parts of sub-Saharan Africa that had centralized states had fairly predatory extractive uh, centralized states. So that's a very different dynamic, the history of construction of economic and political institutions in sub-Saharan Africa. We talk about that a little bit in the book. If you thought about the case of the Middle East, you know, how would you think about the Middle East fitting into this kind of scenario? Well, you know, I'm not a scholar of the Middle East, but I always sort of think, knowing what I know about Latin America, that you know, this has a lot of similarities with Latin America. That the Middle East, you know, in the in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, kind of fell under the sway of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was a very kind of uh, um, patrimonial uh, organization which never really controlled most of its empire. It tax farmed, it ruled indirectly through local elites. That's exactly what the Spanish did. You know, I was talking about coerced labor in Spanish Latin America. That wasn't Spanish people who organized that. That was local indigenous leaders who were contracted to, to, coerce, to, to organize the coerced labor. So they tax farmed, they ruled indirectly, they spent no resources providing public goods, roads, education, anything else. That's my understanding of what went on in most of the Ottoman Empire, uh, five minutes, okay. Uh, so, so, so the historical, you know, d uh, sort of poverty of the Middle East, it seems to me, is closely related to the dynamics of the construction of economic and political institutions during this colonial period. It's very similar to what happened in the Mughal Empire, also in the north of India, which was a kind of very similar type of empire based on tax farming, very little investment in public goods, ruled indirectly through uh, local elites. And then what happened in the Middle East? Well, the Middle East fell under the sway of European colonial empires. And then after independence, you see many of the same dynamics. You see one-party states, you see military rule. And if you took a non-oil Middle Eastern country, uh, it has very similar levels of income per capita to Central American or poorer Latin American countries. So I'm not saying, you know, we couldn't talk about oil or Islam or lots of other things, you know, but I am saying that, you know, what we try to do in the book to the extent we talk about the Middle East is to sort of say, well, you know, we can think of these dynamics of historical institutional construction and persistence over time very much in the same terms that we do uh, in other parts of the world, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa. So let me talk a little bit more about transitions and then I'll shut up. Okay, well, we could have talked about the Black Death. We're not going to talk about the Black Death. Uh, gosh, we're not going to talk about Robert Mugabe either. Okay, so, 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 so transitions. Okay, so, so I talked a little bit about the British case, the Glorious Revolution, South Africa, whatever, conflict over institutions. Uh, let me talk about conflict, okay? And I could talk a little bit, like I say, a few remarks about the Arab Spring, and then I'll shut up. Uh, so it's about conflict over institutions. But there's lots of conflicts historically. Latin America had lots of revolutions, civil wars, conflict. But I'm arguing that there's enormous persistence in the way Latin American society functions. So that suggests that conflict might be an outcome of you know, these institutional structures, but conflict in itself doesn't necessarily lead to a better outcome, okay? So one of the things we kind of focus on in the book is to say, okay, fine, conflict is, you know, drives institutional change, but conflict, revolt, revolution, whatever it is, doesn't necessarily create more inclusive political or economic institutions. And one we use different concepts for talking about that, but one concept we use is from sociology, which is called the iron law of oligarchy, which is this idea in sociological theory that in some sense what conflict is mostly about is 
elite circulation, that one elite is replaced by a new elite. And what we try to say in the book is that what we can, by looking at these historical cases, is you know, what is it that distinguishes a conflict which leads to a more inclusive society as opposed to a conflict that just reproduces some elite dominance. So and one extractive society reproduces itself with, in a, di with a different like, head at the top, okay? or maybe with different details. What seems to matter is the nature of the coalition that's involved in the conflict. If you look at this glorious revolution I was mentioning earlier in 1688, what's interesting about that is that nearly the whole of society in some sense was pitted against the monarchy. The sort of people from all over the political spectrum, Whigs and Tories, which were the kind of two nascent political parties at the time, mercantile elites, landowners, professional people, all sorts of people were kind of pitted against this. So a very broad coalition in society got together. This wasn't a kind of putsch by the Bolshevik party or something like that. This was a much broader social movement that got uh, involved in that. And we tried to illustrate what aspects of that were important. So one aspect of that which was very important is that if you want to mobilize a broad coalition, you have to use kind of instruments or concepts or a program which really has some sort of universal appeal, not just some client clientelistic mobilization of, you know, if we get into power, I'll give you this job or I'll give you that or something. You need, you need, a, much more, you need a much broader kind of programmatic approach to winning power. And that, it, in, that seems to stick. I'm not sure I have a great theory of it sticking, but we illustrate with some examples how that stuck. If you look at England after 1688, what you really see is that as an outcome of these political conflicts, you get something like the rule of law emerging. Because to challenge the monarchy, people appeal to these principles which sort of said, it's not right that, you know, that, it's not right that the monarchy intervenes to, ha to hand out these monopolies or to intervene in legal cases, to get a legal case winning for this person who's connected to them. This is, you know, there, there are principles. And once the, once the conflict took place motivated by these principles, it was very difficult for one subset of that coalition to then kind of jettison those principles ex post. Okay, so I would say if you thought about the Arab Spring, you know, the Arab Spring fits kind of very well in some sense into the framework in the book. These were countries with kind of very extractive political and economic institutions. People resented that, you know, there wasn't some kind of false consciousness. It's not that Middle Eastern people somehow adapted themselves and thought, you know, this is our lot and, you know, this is great or whatever. They were unhappy about not having economic <coughs> opportunities or political they rights. Your book. Hmm? They read your book. They <laughs> <laughs> so they struggled against it and they solved the collective action problem, which is something hard to do. Okay? So then the question is, you know, is this, does this herald the emergence of inclusive economic and political institutions in Tunisia or Egypt or wherever it was? Well, the, what the theory says is that depends an awful lot on the nature of the coalition, and in particular, how the coalition stays together or whether this conflict manages to actually establish these more universal programmatic principles. Okay? So then you'd be very concerned that the situation becomes oligarchized you know, or some groups start to dominate at the expense of other groups. So, so I guess maybe other people can talk about that, but I just wanted to kind of end by getting to that point about what creates differences between different types of conflicts and what sort of conflict would you expect to lead to a kind of a more inclusive society and thus a, thus a much more successful economic society also. So I'll shut up. Wow, um, great. Thanks a lot, uh, Jim, for this really wonderful talk and for presenting um, your theory of political economy um, and for marshalling really extraordinary evidence to back your theory going back to colonial times. I think your book even goes back to the Roman Empire even, you know. And the Neolithic Revolution. Um, I really, uh, it was hard, very hard for me to stop you because I really, really enjoyed um, listening to all these stories and anecdotes. Uh, but I really thought I have to stop. No, no, it's fine. Uh, yeah. One, because so people buy the book and read more stories. I don't want you to uh, all the stories <laughs> in the book. So let's do something for them. Um, I'll open the floor for discussion now and for questions, uh, so we can also get you know people's sort of point of view on this and you know for their reaction to the book and to the theory you're presenting. So we're now taking questions from the floor.
Well, I was just trying to talk a little bit about it at the end. I was just alluding to that. Yeah, that the, the, you know, from the point of view of the book, the question is what sort of conflict is it, and what sort of coalition is pushing for, for, for you know, for change and institutional change, and what's the, what's the strategies they're using for that. said about the Arab Spring is you were speaking about the cost of repression and you were saying that the people in some part, some countries of the region have resolved the, the I don't know what you said, the, the, the challenge of the collective action. Uh, could you yeah. say a little bit more on that? Because as you were saying, you're not yet going to Saudi Arabia, but I may be going tomorrow. So I'd like to say, <laughs> Mr. Robinson says this is what you should be doing. And in terms of how far should the people go in terms of protesting, being sent to jail, possibly tortured, killed? in order for the whole population to follow the protest? Well, I, you know, I think that the regime in Saudi Arabia is able, to, is able to weather these pressures because it has far more instruments for controlling society than these other regimes had. You know, it has a very powerful mechanism of patronage delivery and, uh, you know, Inter and it has enormous control over society, not just through normal instruments, but through many traditional instruments as well. You know, it's like a, you know, it's a sort of state which took a traditional social structure and mapped it onto a modern state. But that gives us a lot more instruments for controlling society than a more modernized state does. So whether it be wealth because of the oil also, but also not just, I don't think it's not just about the wealth, it's also about other types of mechanisms of control it have, has over society. So, so, so uh, I mean, you know, I couldn't pretend to really understand, you know, but I think if you look at the pattern of which regimes collapsed, it was the more modernized ones, you know, without oil. Uh, I guess the, the Libyan case is sort of anomalous, but, you know, would Libya have collapsed if the France and Britain hadn't felt so guilty about cozying up to Colonel Gaddafi? Uh, so, so, you know, uh, they just have more instruments for staying in power. You know, how long will that last? I, I don't know. You know, will that be eroded by modernization? I, I don't know. But, you know, I think that if you think across the, you know, if you think across the different regimes in the Middle East, it's not, you know, you could say one thing is the ability of people to solve the collective action problem. So that's part of the story. And that's somehow very idiosyncratic and very difficult to predict. You know, when I was a student, when I was a PhD student in the United States, I had a lot of friends who were, this is 19, late 1980s, I had a lot of friends who were training to be Sovietologists. They were going to spend the rest of their lives studying the Soviet Union. Suddenly, six months later, it didn't exist anymore. So these things are very difficult to predict, you know, I think. And, you know, that's certainly true here. And, and you know, and then what happens? Well, that depends exactly on this ability of the regime to repress and what levers they have for controlling society or diffusing this collective action. And, you know, but I, you know, that's, that's not really what the book is about, but I, you know, that's a very interesting topic. But I guess you're safe to go tomorrow. Well, question, because you mentioned modernization. Yeah. It was a factor in the collapse of certain of the regime in the region, but Saudi Arabia has one of the highest rate of uh, subscription to Twitter, Facebook, or they say. No, but I, uh, but I think in terms of, well, modernization is kind of very multifaceted, you know. So, so I guess I'm just talking about you know, my impression is that in the, I mean, I know much more about Abu Dhabi, actually, than I do about Saudi Arabia, but, you know, in the case of, you know, they seem to have many traditional structures of loyalty and control in society, working through families and social structures, which are still there, despite other aspects of modernization, but which are presumably very powerful in terms of creating order, you know, and, and diffusing collective action against the regime. But you don't have that in Egypt or Tunisia or, you know, you don't have those instruments. In principle. <laughs> it's out of stock, and for some reason it was being sold. Yeah, yeah. Bringing some more copies. But you can download it if you have iPads or Kindles. I recommend downloading it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's frustrating. Um, uh, uh, I was wondering if you think foreign influence has any role, because in the exact foreign, foreign influence, uh -huh. national influence, it's simply because the cases you've spoken about very interesting. <laughs> Uh, either there was no foreign influence or foreign influence was negligible, with the, with the exception of apartheid. But in the case of the Arab Spring, for instance, taking Egypt, you've discussed that you know it, the system could reproduce itself. There's another oligarchy. But yep. 
and it could go either way, depending on the broadness of the coalition. One of the factors is an economic factor, and yesterday they received six billion dollars from you know the IMF. I'm not sure if you think foreign intervention or foreign policies or international politics in in, in the second iteration, let's say, of the Arab Spring has a role, not just internal dynamics. And yeah. if you think what it is. Yeah. I mean, I think the answer to that is, 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 is almost certainly yes. I think, I think you're, you're right that, you know, that's something that we don't talk about very much in the book uh, because I think that, uh, you know, you can certainly point to instances where foreign intervention has been important in, you know, pushing a country in one direction or another or trying to block a particular, you know, change. But, but I, I, I guess we've always seen that at the end of the day as basically being second order compared to the other things we talk about. You know, I mean, I could give you examples. If you think about uh, South America, for example, the CIA were heavily involved in, you know, creating coups, coup d'etats in Guatemala or Chile. You know, and you could look at the Chilean case and you could say, well, you know, the CIA gave the, gave the green light to the military to overthrow a democratically, you know, elected socialist government in 1973. And, you know, doesn't that mean that the U.S. is just like messing up everything? And, well, yeah, so I, do I believe that the role of the CIA was important? Yes. But the CIA intervened in this incredible conflict in Chilean society over how to organize society, a socialist society. All these elites were being expropriated. They were encouraging the army to go on. You know, what was the role of the CIA? Yeah, there's some role, but my guess is quantitatively, it's much smaller than the role of these conflicts in Chilean society. So I think we want to emphasize, and you could say the same thing about Guatemala, you know, in the 1950s. So, so we want to emphasize more what we think is the kind of the really big thing. But I, I totally agree with you that in some context, the other thing could be even bigger. And I would say, you know, there's, you know, there's all sorts of foreign policy interests in the United States or wherever it is over, you know, regime dynamics and whatever. But, yeah, the really good news for people in the Middle East is that, you know, with all of the tar sands now in the Dakotas being exploited, soon the U.S. is going to be, you know, completely self. It's not going to need to import any oil. And so it will lose interest in Middle Eastern politics, and maybe that will be very good for democracy and kind of sane policy everywhere in the Middle East. Inclusive economic institutions, and do you think that uh, a welfare state like the European welfare state and uh, Sweden and, uh, is more sustainable than the capitalist system of the states because it has, as I think, a more inclusive economic system? So, uh, Meaning more economic equalities. Yeah, I, I mean the way. So I think about it. So okay. So 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 I think that you know if, if I, I sort of said there's all these areas of grey in reality, but you know if, if, from the point of view of the book, if you thought about Sweden and the United States, then they're both basically inclusive societies. You know, in the sense that I tried to talk about. So of course they differ in all sorts of other ways. They differ in the extent of inequality, the amount of social insurance. But I think that's within an inclusive society, there's lots of scope for organizing these types of things. You know, I mean, Japan, you know, would be an inclusive society according to our, you know, view. But Japan has lots of very, very different types of social institutions than Sweden or the United States. And, and so I think there's, people's preferences differ a lot, you know. I'm not taking a view on where that comes from. Why is it that Swedish people, you know, Sweden's a homogeneous, small place. They're, you know, they care about each other. They have high social capital. I'm not taking a view on what the roots of that is. That gives you very different preferences, perhaps, over the extent of inequality you'll tolerate and the amount of social insurance you prefer. But I think that's all basically consistent with uh, having an inclusive society. I mean, you could take the view that Swedes sacrifice some amount of income for that. You know, perhaps there's fewer incentives in Sweden, and that's why it's poorer. And, you know, but perhaps that's a trade-off you're willing to make. You're willing to have more social insurance and more equality. Uh, and that's the type of society you want to live in. But they're both, at the end of the day, they're both very rich, economically successful, inclusive politically, inclusive economically societies. You know, it's a democratic society. People vote to have high tax rates. Fine. You know, let a large government, let them do it. That's their, you know, that, that's all consistent, I guess, in our view, with having an inclusive society. There's no one 
simplistic model. You know, the Japanese model of capitalism is something completely different from the Swedish or the American model. There's a lot of choice within inclusive mm -hmm. societies to have, you know, have different types of ways of doing things. So this is not a kind of peen to American capitalism. You know, I'm British, so I could never do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you allow me, I have a couple of questions, Jim. One is far and one is close. The one that's far, I mean, one, if one were to look at the modern history of the world and countries, we know that democratization, which is a shorthand probably for inclusive, politically inclusive institutions, unless you agree, disagree. But in any uh -huh. case, we have, we have that on the one hand. And at the same time, most people who are documenting inequality, either between countries or even within countries, they either tell you that it has remained the same or gotten worse. One would expect the trend to be in the opposite direction. That is, the more inclusive political institutions you have, the more egalitarian you become. That's not what you're observing. So there is a little paradox. I have one more. Okay. The other one has to do with, I'm very curious about this critical juncture and this idea of conflict. When you have a conflict, you are mobilized socially, you change the regime, and you are basically saying that correctly so, that it could go right and it could go wrong, right? I mean, this, this uh, conflict and the way it can fit. What happens when you have the two things? You know, the conflict is associated with division of societies. I'm talking about Egypt. And where you have 50% on one, hand, on one side and the 50 on the other side. Well, how broad is that? Or well, it's not broad at all, that's one. And the yeah. second one is when religion is, uh, is the name of the game. So how would that change your way of characterizing the critical <coughs> juncture, if you like, and what would make a conflict turn positive or negative? Yeah, so, uh, so those are great questions. I would say, you know, in the book, we, we try to stick with this language of inclusive political institutions rather than democracy. And, you know, why is that? Well, I think some democracies are not very inclusive. You know, if you take uh, Venezuela, for example, in South America, you know, Venezuela is a country where, you know, 51% of people love President Chavez and 49% of people hate him. And if, with the 51% in power, they can do whatever they like to the other 49%. There's no checks and balances, basically. There's no, you know, there's just no, there's very few protections of minorities or anything, you know. So I would say this is not an include, this is not a very inclusive uh, society. And if there's a fluctuation and the other 49% manage to get in power, you know, they'll do the same thing back to the Chavistas. So, so maybe democracy is a sort of necessary but not sufficient condition for inclusive uh, political institutions. That many, many democracies are very dysfunctional in the way they work. And, 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 and you know, and that, I mean, maybe that's a part of the process, but I don't think that's, you can't, you know, if you look in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, people were much too happy with themselves for having, oh, there was this wave of democratization in the 1990s in sub-Saharan Africa. But then after a bit, people thought, oh, yeah, this is just the start of a process of creating a different type of society. And you can set up the mechanisms of elections and things like that, but it's very difficult. It's much harder to create, I think, it's to create a non-clientelistic type of democracy, for example. So, 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 so I'd say that comment about democracy, I would think, what's the connection between democracy, let's say, and inequality? I'd say the big picture, you know, if I, if I thought about the countries where I actually know, you know, something about the historical evidence, say in Western Europe, and even in North America, the picture is that democratization, at least in the last, over the last 100, 150 years, has really promoted equality. You know, if you look at Western European societies, the 20th century, which went along with intensified democracy, went along with falling inequality. You can see, well, those two things are correlated. That doesn't prove that democracy, the democratization was actually creating inequality. But I do think that looking over a longer run, there's definitely a, some correlation between intensified democracy, in, at least in OECD countries for which there's long historical evidence, and, uh, and uh, falling inequality. That being said, you know, that holding constant democracy, there's a lot of variation in inequality. And I guess even within a democracy, there's lots of things that can drive inequality. You know, so why is it that in the United States, inequality has gone up so much in the last 20 years, say, and it hasn't gone up in France or the Netherlands or whatever? Well, that has a lot to do with the interaction between 
different shocks, technological change, but also labor market institutions. You know, labor market institutions are fundamentally very different in Western Europe than in North America. You don't have trade unions in North America. There's much less control on corporate elites, you know, voting themselves massive pay rises. I mean, I don't know what, you know, I still, I don't really understand what the evidence about, you know, whether this is really a kind of return to skill or talent, you know, which is coming from innovation in corporate form or globalization or innovations in, I, I don't know. I, 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 there's a lot of discussion in economics at the moment about what's driven this massive increase in inequality at the US. But whatever's driven it, you can see that, you know, it hasn't happened in Western Europe. And the technologies and all this other stuff are very similar. So it must be something to do with the way the institutions work, with labor market institutions, with corporate institutions. I mean, some people think it's to do with social norms, actually. Thomas Piketty, who's one of the big scholars of, uh, who was at Paris School of Economics, is one of the big scholars of this increasing inequality. I mean, Thomas' view is that in the United States, Reaganomics basically destroyed these social norms that inhibited powerful elites voting themselves massive salaries, that corporate, mechanism, co corporate government's mechanisms never really functioned to restrict what CEOs could do. And once Reaganomics came and sort of said, it's okay to be rich, you know, it's all, you know, it's your return to your talent and your skills. And, you know, so people were sort of freed from these social norms of like, uh, and inequality just kind of exploded because people just were uninhibited. You know, it's like the kind of the Wall Street version of economic history. So, so, so I, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know what Thomas' evidence for that is. I mean, he has theoretical models, but I don't know what their evidence is. So I would say, you know, there's lots of scope for dynamics of inequality even within a democracy. But my guess is that democracy really puts a bound on that in the sense that, you know, now in the US, there's really a perception of this massive increase in inequality is difficult to understand or justify. Many people are concerned that it's very corrosive of other institutions in society. It's even corrosive of democracy itself. You know, it's clear that money's become more important in politics. So just as money becomes more important in politics, you have this enormous increase in inequality. This is something that people are worried about in terms of undermining democracy itself. So I, I my guess is that this is going to trick this is already triggering a kind of reaction to it which will which will reverse this trend in inequality so i think that you know maybe democracy puts some kind of bound at least on what's happening now and you know as i said i guess there's a lot of variation even within these basically inclusive societies in economic institutions that are very consequential for inequality Oh, uh, religion. He said, should we talk about religion? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know about religion. You know, I, I think that, you know, we, we talk in the book about uh, some of these famous hypotheses about, you know, I talked about Protestantism and Catholicism in the Americas. And, you know, uh, my sense is that, you know, if you look historically, that the, this huge diversity of religion is consistent with economic success. You know, look at the religion. You know, it used to be the idea that you had to have some big monotheistic religion. Or look at Japan. You know, we're all everyone's a god in Japan. The microphones are god. The water bottle. You know, the trees are gods. You know, everyone's a god in Japan. It's a kind of nice thing. You know, but you know, the J Japanese religion is something completely different. You know, it's like an animistic religion, like an African. You know, it's sort of. But that's consistent with very successful economic growth. Catholicism, Protestantism. I, so we've never seen that particular religious practices are either impediments or enormous benefits to economic uh, progress. You know, we've just never seen, you know, we've never seen that in kind of statistical analysis and thinking historically about these cases. We've never seen that as being important. You know, we were talking this morning about this, that, you know, it's interesting to think about the Arab Spring and the conflict in the Middle East in the conflict in the context of religion. You know, if you go back and read a lot of the history of many of these conflicts I'm talking about, like English conflicts, 60, I talked about 1688, the Glorious Revolution. A large group of historians would discuss that as being a religious conflict, that the main thing that triggered it was the fact that James II was a closet Catholic and that the Protestant majority in society couldn't stand having a Catholic king. And in fact, one of the things that came out of the Glorious Revolution was a thing called the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights established parliamentary sovereignty 
It you know, changed all sorts of political institutions. And I guess I would say that's the most important thing about the Bill of Rights. But the Bill of Rights also said that no Catholic can ever be king or queen of England. So other historians would focus on the religious part and say, this is all about religion. This is a religious conflict. Look, the most imp the, the, no Catholic could be king or queen. And I guess I look at that and I say, well, you know, that really at the end of the day wasn't very significant. If you go back at the time and you look at what people said, people talked about religion all the time, religious conflicts, Catholicism, Protestants. So I know, you know, this is very different. We're in this historical moment where, you know, there's huge controversy about how secular or, or you know, society should be or religious or, and I'm not saying, you know, that's not important in this context or it doesn't affect institutions or, or, or kind of political cleavages or all sorts of other things. But I guess in the book, that's really downplayed because we just, we just never saw how you could construct a kind of theory which would explain these facts by appealing to, uh, appealing to kind of religious conflicts or religious cleavages. But I do think, you know, as you were saying earlier today, that what's very interesting, you know, religion is a very powerful way of kind of mobilizing people, I guess. It's a powerful way of mobilizing people and solving collective action. And, and you know, but that was true in 1688 in England as well, so. Jim asked a question for a move. Uh, take more questions from the floor. Are clientelistic states, in your definition, as inclusive political institutions or extractive political institutions? No, I, I would say clientelism is a sort of is anathema to inclusion. You know, like what's clientelism or patrimonialism about? It's about, you know, I, I give something to you and you give something back to me. You know, I give you a job or a favor or a contract and you support me. You know, you, you know a patrimonial state is about exclusive dealing, offering privileges or perquisites or it's not, a, it, what, what, you know, that's a very non-inclusive way of interacting with society. It's not about public goods, it's not about universal principles, you know, because universal principles don't apply. You know, you get a legal, you know, de you get a legal verdict in your favor if you're my friend and otherwise you don't, you know. So I'd say patrimonialism is a big impediment to having an inclusive uh, society. What? History is not history. Well, I think, you know, we, what we emphasize, we do emphasize that there's a lot of inertia, you know, that, that there's a lot of inertia in societies that, it, you know, over time. But, but, you know, societies also change, you know, societies change, you know, and any kind of society, even in the United States, one thing we emphasize is that, yes, there are these sort of positive feedback loops, like the frontier example I was giving you. But, Institutions are always challenged. In the late 19th century, there were these people called the robber barons. You know, this is another case of like very massive increases in inequality, with not much changing in not much changes in political institutions after the Civil War, but huge increase in inequality. These robber barons, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Mellon, you know, Vanderbilt, they became incredibly rich. They tried to get into politics. They tried to capture the political system, and you know, many people make analogies between what went on in this period, the so-called Gilded Age, and what's going on in the United States now. But, you know, what we point out in the book is that, so that starts, but, you know, that creates this backlash from society. You know, it creates a political movement, the populist and progressive movement. Uh, the role of the media, actually, was incredibly important uh, in, in creating, there's a wonderful book called The History of the Standard Oil Company, which was written by a journalist called Ida Tarbell, which had a big effect on kind of exposing all of these predatory practices, the Standard Oil Company. This was owned by Rockefeller, you know, the world's richest man. And that's the origin of antitrust. I was talking about antitrust and Bill Clinton. The origin of antitrust is the backlash in society against the Gilded Age and the robber barons. So that's why I tend to be relatively optimistic about this situation in the US because I still see fundamentally a kind of very democratic society in the US and I see you know the pr prospect of society mobilizing against this increase in inequality you know in the same way that it did in the second half of the 19th, 19th century so so yes so so there's you know <laughs> history is not we we have I didn't talk about contingency very much but it's in the book so Hi, uh, Professor Robinson. Um, thanks for this talk. I'm a big fan of, of your talk. I first um, listened to it on iTunes U, and I follow your blog as well. Uh, I've been very intrigued with this question of why nations fail and succeed um, uh, since some time. And so if we take your, your model, basically, um, and if we take the beginning of time as the beginning of colonization, it does explain what happened afterwards. 
But, it, but if we take the beginning of time, let's say 2,000 years before, my question might sound a bit simplistic, um, how come is it not, for example, the Anka Empire that went on and colonized Europe? Or why didn't Africa at some point uh, become the most powerful uh, continent in the world? Yeah. And my second quick question is, um, there's a French uh, anthropologist called Emmanuel Todd who um, tries to answer the same question, why nations fail, with a totally different model. And he goes back to the structure of the family. Uh -huh. um, how open are you to other models that try to answer this question? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, so, I mean, I think, you know, part of the, the, the point of the book, actually, is, is you know, is, is to, so maybe it's not explicit enough, is to try to address this first issue, you know. If you ask me, you know, is there any intrinsic reason why Britain, you know, is much richer than Sierra Leone, or United States is rich and Colombia isn't? I'd say the answer is absolutely no. You know, there's no reason why, his, historically, why Colombia couldn't have income per capita of $50,000 and the U.S. have $6,000, or Sierra Leone wouldn't have been ri much richer than Britain. I mean, this is something that Ashmolo and I have been trying to work on for a long time. We've always had this feeling that these kind of very deterministic theories like Jared Diamond or Jeffrey Sachs or whatever, which sort of says, you know, you have some adverse geography or whatever it is, you know, they're totally misconceived, you know. And in fact, one of the things we try to point out in the book is that Britain was a very unlikely place to be so economically successful. You know, if you think about you go, let's go back to the Neolithic Revolution. Think about the Neolithic Revolution. Neolithic Revolution, you know, starts down, it starts here with the Natufians, you know, down the road. It starts like, you know, 9,000, 10,000 BC. The Neolithic Revolution didn't get to England until about 4,000 BC, you know, five or 6,000 years later. Britain was way, way behind the curve, you know. It was always behind the curve. If you look at the end of the Roman Empire, when the Western Roman Empire collapses in the middle of the 5th century AD, it collapsed most definitively in Britain. Everything disappeared. The wheel disappeared, writing disappeared, pottery disappeared. You know, there was technological regress. The place disappeared into a complete mess, you know, while the Eastern Roman Empire carried on, you know, with writing and civilization and technology. And, you know, Britain was way behind the Levant you know, in that period, on every single dimension you could, you know, right up to the early modern period, you know, Britain was, a, it was a backward place, you know. So this was nothing, there was nothing ordained about this. It just happened through a series of sort of contingent conflicts that Britain created this very specific kind of set of institutions, you know, and that was what was critical. And from a kind of, you know, I would say from a world historical point of view, there's no reason why other parts of the world, that couldn't have happened, that could have happened in lots of other parts of the world, but, but, but you know, that's just really an outcome of very specific historical dynamics, often, you know, created by idiosyncratic factors or all sorts of things, you know. So, so I, you know, so that's part of the thing we t try to talk about in the book, that I think that, you know, the economic history of the world could be totally different. And I guess that's a very optimistic thing. People often accuse us of being very pessimistic, but I've never understood that. You know, this suggests that there's no reason why, you know, Egypt couldn't have the income per capita of the United States. There's nothing that determines that by geography or culture or anything else. You know, it's just the way that historically the society has just been organized in a way which has just undermined the potential for sustained economic success and modern technology and innovation. And, you know, but if institutions change, that's difficult. You know, that's not something that's easy. I'm not pretending that's something that's easy to do. It's not about having some clever economic advisor or anything else. Then, then the society could become rich. You know, in fact, in the 19th century, I guess you could say when Muhammad Ali was in full swing, Egypt was actually on track to a very different, much more modern, rich society, which then got derailed by the expansion of European colonialism. You know, when I mean, there was other stuff going on too. Uh, like a debt, debt crisis. And so, yeah, but that was, it was very difficult in that era of European colonial expansion to actually create an autonomous political and economic project the way Muhammad Ali did because you just threatened too many interests, basically. Uh, but, you know, that's an example where, you know, Egypt could have been a completely different country today if that hadn't been derailed by European colonialism. So, so, so I think, you know, there is a huge scope for, for, for uh, you know, uh, it's not science fiction to think that the world could be different, you know, and I, th I guess that's, you know, that's a hopeful thing. And I guess lots of people think it is becoming different now, you know. What was your other question? Sorry. I feel passionate about that topic. Ah, uh, yeah. No, I, you know, we have a chapter in the, you know, the book is not, uh, 
talk about, we have one chapter called Theories That Don't Work, where we talk about alternative hypotheses. I mean, a lot of our scientific work is endlessly agonizing about other hypotheses, but that's not really the point of this book. In this book, we just try to develop this one argument and sort of try to show how far you can push it and what it can explain. We don't agonize about alternative uh, hypotheses. I mean, I think Todd's, I mean, I have actually have a friend called Jean-Philippe Plateau who's a big fan of Todd's hypothesis. So I think that's a very interesting hypothesis. And I think there's also lots of sources of variation in institutions. You know, if you ask me, you know, why is it that in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, there's much less of a history of centralized political authority than there is in the Middle East or Eurasia, I'd say that has a lot to do with social structure in sub-Saharan Africa. So, so lots of, so, there's lots of social institutions in sub-Saharan Africa that are very different from what you see in other parts of the world, which make it much more difficult to kind of concentrate political power. And I guess maybe that's a hypothesis which is, you know, kind of more, more, more related to kind of Todd's ideas. But I, I think that's very interesting. So I, you know, I think there's lots of sources of variation in institutions and great thanks Karim nice question yes thank you very much for your talk um, just very quickly the question of, that I have is how do you can you talk a little bit more about how one gets to these inclusive institutions and the, the potential the revolutionary potential in trying to get them do you need to have a glorious revolution in say they are you need to have something equivalent to the glorious revolution in order to reach these inclusive institutions? Is there revolutionary potential in what you're saying? Or I think at some point you suggested that the elite have to sort of recognize that and go through a reform process. What's more likely to get you to this, to why these institutions suddenly develop? I think that, you know, I think that in reality, let me say that there's shade, you know, there's inclusive and there's extractive. So in reality, there's lots of shades for gray. And so that means that in any one society, maybe there's, lo there's lots of scope for kind of improving institutions. You know. So I could give you lots of examples at a more micro level of how particular changes in the economy or politics had led to you know, more inclusive institutions in some small dimension. Okay? But I guess you know, I would say that you know, the big picture is that uh, you know, if you're in a society which is fundamentally extractive, you know, let's say you know, we're in... North Korea, okay? And maybe there's lots of things that could happen in North Korea which would improve the inclusiveness of society and which the regime won't oppose because, oh yeah, we didn't think about that. Or, yeah, that can happen, that won't really fundamentally threaten our control of society. But that is difficult to accumulate in su with such extractive political institutions because the regime is just going to be too concerned about maintaining its power and so there's probably a lot of scope for things you can do you know if you were the World Bank or the IMF or whatever or you know then you should try to think about maybe there's a lot of stuff beneath the radar screen I, ha I have a good friend at Harvard called Paul Farmer who's a he's a professor in the medical school and he runs this NGO called Partners in Health. The, the, the president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, is one of the founders of Partners in Health. And they build hospitals in poor countries. And they have this sort of implicit political model, which is they build stuff under the radar screen. You know, so, so they build hospitals in Haiti or in Rwanda. And where is, the hosp where is the main hospital they have in Haiti? Is that like in the capital city? Or No, it's up way up in the central plateau in the middle of nowhere in some little town called Mirabale. Why is it there? Well, it's out of the control of national politicians. The game is in Port-au-Prince. You know, they don't want politicians controlling who gets health care, what, you know. So they, they kind of try to work under the radar screen of these predatory politicians because they don't want access to health clientelized or they want to give access to poor people. And there's lots of poor people in these rural areas, so that works. What about all the poor people in the urban areas? fine, but that's hard to deal with because, because then you just get captured and taken over. So, so, so you can do a lot of stuff, you know, in the, even in an extractive society, you can do a lot of stuff to make it more inclusive, but that's difficult to accumulate. For, you know, the logic of the system makes it difficult to accumulate things like that. You could say, well, but people don't, there's unintended consequences. People don't really understand, like, what's going on. Well, that's true, but you know, if unintended, if they get big enough to really shake, to change the society, then people are going to notice, you know. So, so I think that's why we kind of emphasize these larger conflicts, you know, that it's, it, if you look historically at these transitions, it seems to be 
what Ahmed was saying, I didn't use this, I didn't talk about this language in the talk, but we use it in the book, this notion of a sort of critical juncture, which is a, a kind of hallowed language in political science and political sociology. But, 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 but you know, something like creation of a colonial society, you know, or these glorious revolution or things like that. So I guess we emphasize these conflicts seem to be, if you look historically, these things seem to be really important in generating institutional transition. You know, think about the U.S. South. I mentioned the U.S. South earlier. You know, why is the U.S. South? It was re very poor. As late as the 1940s, income per capita in the U.S. South was 40% of the average level in the U.S. Why is the U.S. South uh, as rich as the average income per capita in the U.S. today? Because black people solved the collective action problem in the 1950s, the civil rights movement. They started organizing, and they challenged and the institutions in the South that kept the South poor and kept black people under control crumbled. Okay? Now, that's not the whole story. There was other stuff going on. There was technological change. Of course, they were functioning in the system where they could put pressure on the national state to intervene in the South, which is an option that you know, lots of countries don't have. So they were trapped into this system, which was basically functional. But that's still also a, it's a process of collectively mobilizing of, you know, of like identifying your grievances and, and mobilizing, you know, creating an agenda and fighting. So I, you know, I guess that's, so that's why we emphasize, you know, something like the Arab Spring, it seems to be, you know, you can just see yourself, like look at the change that's gone on in Egypt, in Tunisia and all sorts of places as a consequence of that, you know, it's too, you know, but then the question is, well, does that really lead to a different type of society? And I, I'm, I'm not sure I have more to say about that. I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of where we are. This is something we're working on kind of theoretically and more sort of generally empirically just trying to study case, case studies so we can try to develop better, you know, a better kind of, you know, make more, make more predictions, make tighter predictions in some sense. But, you know, like when is it that this broad coalition emerges, for example? Well, you know, well, that's, I don't really have an explanation for that, you know. Uh, and what is it that keeps it together? I'm not sure how important it is to keep it together. You know, you could look at lots of examples, like in the Philippines in the 1980s, they had this thing called People's Power. They had this dictator called Ferdinand Marcos. And again, you know, he bumped off, he, he, he assassinated a leading politician called uh, uh, Benigno Aquino. And uh, actually, he'd just been on leave at Harvard. And he went back to the Philippines, and he was basically shot walking out, walking down the steps from the air, from the air, from the airplane. And that create that just killing that person. He was a very important uh, politician and kind of uh, a, 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 a fighter against the regime. And that created a big backlash in society, and like like the killing of Rafik Hariri I did here, I guess in the, 2005. Same thing. It created this huge kind of it released this huge pent up social animosity. People started in the demonstrating, organizing, and they forced out President Marcos. Okay? It was a very broad coalition. Everybody hated Marcos. But then the only thing that united them was the fact they hated Marcos. So, so, and they let, Marcos left before they really had time to come up with an alternative agenda. So then what happened? Well, just like, you, you know, the people who were most organized took over. Who were the most organized? They were the traditional oligarchs, political dynasties in the Philippines who'd been running the country before Marcos became dictator. In fact, when Marcos declared martial law in 1972, he justified it by saying, we have to break the control of these oligarchs and elites and political dynasties on Philippine society. But when he left, they took over again because they were far, they were, you know, they hid and, you know, they went into exile. But as soon as he left, they took over again because they had the most organized, they were organized. They had control, they had, you know, they had local organization, they had machines, they reactivated their political machines. So they were the most organized. So that, so then you didn't really have a broad coalition because, because the thing unraveled and it went back to a kind of status quo ante of Philippine politics before 1972. So I guess, you know, so, so you have to have, you know, so, so, so that was sort of, it was all over in a flash in some sense before an old, real alternative political movement could kind of start. And I think, you know, what's interesting here is, well, what is the, you know, of course there's lots of progress here. You have, you know, you have the creation of democracy, you know, kind of functioning democracy in Egypt and Tunisia. Is that the first time? I mean, this is like the most democratic elections they've ever had in Egypt. That's, a, that's an awful good start, it seems to me. But that's probably not enough to stop the, stop the transition becoming oligarchized, you know. If the Muslim Brotherhood, what sort of state do the Muslim Brotherhood want? Do they want a different type of patrimonial state with them handing out the contracts or the jobs or the favors or, you know, that's a much bigger coalition, of course, than underpinned the Mubarak state. 
Uh, but it's still, you know, it's still a relatively extractive coalition, I would guess. It's not going to be based on the kind of type of programmatic politics or universal principles that you really need to have in an inclusive society. But I don't know enough about, you know, the aims of the Muslim Brotherhood or what their objective is, so I wouldn't want to speak about that. I just think, you know, from a kind of abstract point of view, what you'd, what you'd be interested in understanding is whether there's going ahead, you know, there's really a process of trying to incorporate, you know, a very broad cross-section of society. I mean, I would say if you think about this rewriting of the Constitution, that's not a good sign. You know, the fact that everybody except the Muslim Brotherhood basically bailed out and said, you know, we don't, this is, we don't, we, we don't like this process, you know, and, that, and then they got to write the Constitution. This is not a very inclusive process, right? So, so, so that's, a, you know, I'd say that's a bad sign, but, you know, politics is a messy business, you know, so everybody, like, you know, I was saying, everyone wants to be a monopolist, you know, it's not about good guys and bad guys, it's about rational actors with their different programs and interests, and, you know, and, 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 you know, you need to, you know, if you read the, you know, that, that's true in the United States, I don't know if anyone's ever read the Federalist Papers, you know, but James Madison in the Federalist Papers talks about, you know, uh, you know, government, it's not a, we're not angels. It's not a society of angels. You know, you need to have a balance of power. You need to let ambition check ambition. You need to set up a set of institutions which, which this is good for society. It's not really, nobody really wants it, but you just have to let people's, you have to distribute power broadly. I mean, it's kind of inclusive, you know. And so you, that's what you have to try to struggle for. But that's difficult because any one group wants to kind of set itself up. And so, you know, this is, I, I don't know what will be the outcome of this process in any of these uh, countries, you know. I can't predict that, I just, you know. Just for completion, South Africa, the first climate by the Dutch Yeah, that's true, yes, but I mean, what, what's what's that? Sorry, I you know the. Yeah, well, I mean the Dutch are very interesting. You know, in some sense, the Dutch, you know, in the early modern period, the Dutch had wonderful institutions as well. They had wonderful, they had wonderfully inclusive economic and political institutions. But when they were when they when they set up co colonies, they were incredibly predatory. Uh, so, in the East Indies and elsewhere. So, yeah, I mean, I I was just saying that you know if it, the, the 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 organization of Apartheid, the formalization of apartheid takes place after it became an English protectorate in some sense. We'll after. Sorry, I don't think I changed yes. Does this extract mean what you're saying? So would, would it show that there's a broken coalition? Yes. Now? Can you speak up? Yeah. Okay. If that works. <coughs> okay, so the new coalition in Egypt, for example, with a bigger coalition. More broad. Yes. Does that translate into more prosperity, as I, opposed to uh, just uh, more extractive government? I think it probably will, in the sense that you know, uh, South Africa was much richer than Zimbabwe because in South Africa the whites were twenty percent of the population, and in Zimbabwe they were five percent of the population. But I guess that you know, having a sort of clientelistic patrimonial state benefiting the coalition of the Muslim Brothers is better than having one that benefits so Mubarak's. Away from the extractive word inclusive would translate into prosperity in a way of growth. Yes, I think I think that I think that will be that will be good, uh, but it won't make it won't it won't it won't it won't generate enormous economic success. It will generate improvement relative to the previous regime because the coalition involved is broader, but it won't lead to a very different type of society. But that, you know, that being said, you know, I could say if I was going to play the devil's advocate, I would say that at least, you know, I'm not a scholar of Islam, but I would say, you know, that the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, like them or not, Islam is a set of principles. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's law, there's sharia. It's not sort of some free-for-all, clientelistic, personalized, do whatever the hell you like. There's principles. You know, they were applied principles. You may not agree with the principles, but just having principles is a good thing. You know, that actually limits the extent to which you can be patrimonial. And maybe there's even checks and balances in the system. You know, like in Noah Feldman's book about the, about the Islamic State, you know, his explanation for, I mean, I'm not a scholar of Islam, so I couldn't evaluate this, but just to, for what it's worth, his explanation of this demand for Islam or Sharia 
now is a sort of reaction against authoritarianism. It's a kind of demand for some set of rules, you know, non-clientelistic rules or something that might create checks and balances in the political system. And if that were right, you know, that would actually be much more optimistic than, than perhaps, you know, you could imagine. So, you know, rules are good, good things, you know. Oh, great. Jim, thank you okay. so much. Um, ah, yes. Is that this is mine? No, it's not. This mine. is mine. Oh, yes, it's yours. Okay. Can I have it?